It was not the ideal uh, choice, but it was an acceptable choice. Uh, you realize that this was serious business, and if you have a serious business, you have to have diagnosis, you have to confirm it. Uh, had you told me that I'm going to take the patient to the operating room and just explore the patient, you would have flunked. So I think overall, I, I, I would give you a five for this. Yeah, I actually was uh, happy with uh, what you did for the patient and that you worked it through. I think, though, that you're not going to have as much chatter with the uh, examiner. They're going to want to move it a little faster than that. We deliberately went slowly, but they're going to want to move the case more in the rhythm that I was doing it and get you faster to making an operative decision, a yes, no. You did the right thing for this guy, and your patient made it. So I'd, I'd go for a six on that. Uh, the pyloric uh, wasn't so good. But such is life, throw your soldiers back, maybe you'll have some good cases in the next room. Uh, basically, you engage us well, give a nice, uh, concerned approach to the patient, and that's going to count. Uh, it's a good way to be. Thank you. Thank you. Each year, I, I sort of start off with a little bit of a caveat that to condense our field into about a 50-minute lecture is difficult. So I've really kind of chosen some very specific features of urology that I think are relevant and pertinent to uh, both recertification and board exams. So uh, there's a lot of this that uh, leaves out a fair amount of urology. At the end of your slide packet, there's about 10 or 15 slides that I will not cover that are just there, ad addended as kind of supplemental information. They're not quite as high yield as I think these topics are. And those are specifically uh, cancer, urologic oncology, urinary diversion, the concepts of using intestinal tract and reconstruction of the urinary tract, urologic emergencies and then those bonus slides uh, that are in there I won't cover them at the end of your uh, packet and so in oncology we'll start off with prostate cancer uh, the number one cancer non-cutaneous cancer in men in the US uh, the presentation uh, in the current era how does a man get diagnosed with prostate cancer that's a combination of a PSA prostate specific antigen blood test a rectal exam looking for a nodule and and patients are rarely symptomatic so the patient who comes in with blood in the urine or avoiding symptoms is generally not presenting with prostate cancer. The diagnosis is then by ultrasound, transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, and the staging uh, evaluation is usually a CT and bone scan. Uh, the most common treatment modalities are surgery and radiation, roughly 50-50 for the localized prostate cancer patient, with some controversy as to which is more effective. Observation alone is an appropriate treatment for patients who have limited life expectancy because of the slow-growing nature of the disease, and that should always be in your mind if you're asked to manage or discuss management in prostate cancer. And then hormonal deprivation therapy and systemic chemotherapy are also options. Uh, when we operate for prostate cancer, the incision is generally a lower midline abdominal incision or a perineal incision or more recently laparoscopic or robotic approaches have been uh, employed. The common complications of treatment of prostate cancer include erectile dysfunction or impotence and loss of urinary control or incontinence. Intraoperatively, and these are fertile ground for questions, uh, about 1 to 2 percent of these operations will result, depending on the series, in a small tear in the anterior wall of the rectum. Management there, if it's a clean prep situation, is primary repair. If it's a grossly contaminated area with, rectal, with previous radiation, it's generally diverting colostomy and repair. Uh, extensive hemorrhage, urinary extravasation from the anastomosis, and then down the road, stricture of the bladder to the urethra. Uh, kidney cancer or renal cell carcinoma is about the seventh most common cancer in men in America, slightly less common in females. Uh, the vast majority of patients today present incidentally. About 75% of people with kidney cancer this year will find out about it on a scan done for another reason. Biliary disease, back pain, abdominal pain, result in an ultrasound that reveals a asymptomatic renal mass. That's a very big change from 20 years ago when about 75% of patients presented with either weight loss, back pain, or gross hematuria. Uh, and of course, survival and uh, staging has shifted as well with that. The diagnosis in general is either by CT or ultrasound. Uh, we rarely perform percutaneous biopsies of a solid renal mass. 
because the imaging studies are about 95% accurate. So patients go directly from imaging to intervention, and that's a little different than most other cancers. The standard treatments would be either radical nephrectomy, open or laparoscopic, that's removal of the entire kidney, or a partial nephrectomy, removal of just the mass, leaving the rest of the kidney in place. There is no effective chemotherapy. There is no effective radiation therapy. So that's one of the rare instances where you have a pretty clear-cut situation on a question. If the treatment of kidney cancer comes up about systemic chemo, no matter what the drug or radiation, no matter what the treatment or what the fields, it's wrong. It's surgery, surgery, surgery for kidney cancer. How do we do those operations? I mentioned laparoscopic. In terms of open surgery, you can either use a flank approach, thoracoabdominal approach, or even anterior subcostal transperitoneal nephrectomy. Complications are generally uh, for radical nephrectomy. They're relatively few and far between, essentially hemorrhage, loss of control of the renal hilum, uh, pneumothorax from entry of the chest. And for partial nephrectomy, which is a distinct complication, uh, urinary extravasation or leakage of, of urine from the kidney um, involved in the operation. Now, let me see if I can pull up our pointer here for the first time. So this is just a typical CT scan showing a renal mass right here in the hilum of the left kidney in an otherwise asymptomatic patient who presented uh, to the office after a CT scan performed for low back pain, which was actually unrelated to the mass. And this is one that would likely be only treatable by radical nephrectomy as opposed to partial nephrectomy because of its involvement of the medial portion near the renal vessels. So bladder cancer, um, number four cancer in men in America, most commonly induced by cigarette smoking. Uh, the presentation still today remains gross hematuria. There's really no effective screening test for bladder cancer other than the urinalysis. Uh, most patients, roughly 75 to 80%, will present with a chief complaint of gross hematuria. Uh, diagnosis is by cystoscopy or endoscopy of the bladder and biopsy, either under local or general anesthesia. And then the treatment is similar. If it's superficial, about 85% of cases will present with uh, superficial bladder cancer without invasion of the muscle wall of the bladder. And that can be treated by endoscopy alone, removal of the lesion, which is both diagnostic and therapeutic. Uh, and if it's muscle invasive, the other 15%, that's treated with a radical cystectomy or removal of the entire bladder uh, and prostate in the male. Intravesical chemotherapy is a novel concept. This is where after removal of a superficial lesion, which is deemed high risk for recurrence or progression, we treat the patient's bladder with uh, topical administration of either an immunotherapeutic agent called BCG or an actual chemotherapy like mitomycin or thiotipa. And this concept here is to put something directly into the bladder, which will reduce the recurrence rates. That's done as an outpatient with a catheter placed into the bladder every week for six weeks. In terms of radical cystectomy, the operation, again, lower midline incision, um, laparoscopic can be done. It's rare. And the complications vastly revolve around the reconstruction and the bowel complications. And we'll talk about those a little bit in the um, section on urinary diversion. Okay, so I did a fairly rapid run-up into testis cancer. And I'm going to take a deep breath here and pause for a second because this is, I think, the most fertile ground, particularly in urology on board exams, but I'm almost certain as well on general surgery because of a, of a unique triumvirate. It's rare, it's complicated, and it's curable. So those three things put together make test givers very anxious. So this is something most people don't see every day. It's fairly complicated in the sense that there are multiple different treatment schemas and algorithms, and if you screw up, you could potentially cause a major problem in a cancer that's completely curable. So it comes up again and again. And uh, I'll just go through it now a little bit in detail. I have a few more slides on this than the others. Uh, so how does a testis cancer generally present in a young male? Between the ages of 23 and 30, this is the number one cancer in the United States in men. Generally, it's a painless nodule. Patients will report a heaviness, a dull ache occasionally, but a heaviness or a change in the physical appearance of their testis. On average, by the way, it takes about four months for a man to, from time from noticing a nodule in his testis to going to a doctor, which may be somewhat surprising, but that's a four-month lag time from physical presentation to the patient to presentation to a physician. The diagnosis is then based on an ultrasound and a solid mass in the testicle in a man is a cancer. 99.5% of the time, the ultrasound will be diagnostic. Uh, there is no speculation there. Uh, serum blood markers, including a beta HCG, AFP, and LDH, are all measures of the activity of the, of the tumor. 
non-seminomatous germ cell tumor, which is one category, about 50% of all cancers, and seminoma. Those are the two categories. Non-seminoma virtually always will secrete either beta HCG or AFP, and seminoma, about 25% of cases, will secrete just beta HCG. And therefore, um, the presence of AFP in the serum of a patient is diagnostic of non-seminoma. Seminomas never secrete AFP. That's an important part. So if you have an elevated AFP in a patient with germ cell tumor, it is not seminoma. So the treatment starts with an inguinal orchiectomy, not a transcrotal orchiectomy. Patients who have their testicles removed, for instance, for prostate cancer, have it done through an incision in the scrotum. And because of the lymphatic drainage of the testicle, uh, draining back to its area of embryologic origin near the renal hilum, we do not violate that. We, so we start upstream and do an inguinal orchiectomy with early control of the spermatic cord to prevent dissemination of lymphatic metastases into the scrotal drainage, which is uh, to the uh, groin nodes, not to the internal retroperitoneal nodes. Um, after orchiectomy, then there's a staging procedure, which would include a CT scan, in most cases chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and then based on those findings, either chemotherapy radiation or what's called retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, or RPLND. The incisions in, in testis would be inguinal for the orchiectomy, and then either abdominal or thoracoabdominal for the RPLND, if that's required. The complications of RPLND, loss of ejaculation, and that's based on injury to the sympathetic nerve trunks that come off of the lumbar uh, sympathetic chain. Vascular complications, particularly vena cable and aortic injuries, uh, lymphocele, drainage of lymphatic fluid, and then complications associated with systemic chemotherapy, including myelosuppression and uh, secondary or late complications like secondary malignancies and neuropathy. Okay, so I've taken the liberty of, of condensing everything that a urologic oncologist has to know about testis cancer into my own set of working rules, and this is based on multiple questions in past years and uh, comments after the lecture to say, can you try to just boil this down? I really don't want to get a PhD in testicular cancer, but every single year there are two or three questions, and they seem to be the most puzzling questions. Uh, so let's talk about staging first. Stage one, this is very simple, it should be very simple. Stage one means the cancer is in the testicle only. Stage two means it's not in the testicle only anymore, but it's in the abdomen, or what we call the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. Stage two is broken down, importantly, into three substages, 2A, 2B, and 2C, and this is based on the largest retroperitoneal lymph node mass. If it's very small, less than two centimeters, that's a 2A. If it's medium, 2B, greater than five, 2C. Stage three is supradiaphragmatic, and it says lung here, but it's also mediastinum. Lung and mediastinal lymph nodes. With anything else, including retroperitoneal lymph nodes, it becomes a stage three. And then stage four are non-pulmonary metastases. So patients with liver metastases, brain metastases, bone metastases become stage four. And the reason, usually staging systems are kind of things you have to just memorize, but these are important because it translates into the treatments, the treatment algorithms, and this is sort of what we get into here. Everything starts with a radical inguinal orchiectomy. Okay, it's very rare where a question will come up with a patient with an, with an in situ testis cancer, and they ask you what to do, and the answer isn't first do an orchiectomy, because that will tell you, number one, what kind of cancer they have, seminoma versus non-seminoma, and it's 50-50 in general. Non-seminoma is a large category of things that all get lumped together, including choriocarcinoma, embryonal carcinoma, yolk sac tumor, and teratoma. For the purposes of this discussion, all four of those in any combination mean non-seminoma. Okay, so you, you hear them thrown around, embryonal carcinoma, that is a non-seminoma. Okay, seminoma is seminoma. So let's start with that, seminoma. Low volume stage one and two, so testis only, metastatic to lymph nodes, 2A, less than two centimeters, they get primary radiation therapy to the retroperitoneum. About 2,400 rads given over a course of roughly three weeks every day. 99% cure rate, even with metastatic disease. And that's a recurring theme in the whole disease. Seminoma stage 2B and up, anything greater than two centimeters, very simple, chemotherapy. Etoposide and platinum, or EP, 
uh, is the most common drug combination used. You can also use bleomycin, etoposide, and platinum, which is abbreviated BEP. So high volume seminoma is chemo, low volume radiation therapy. Now it gets a little bit trickier. Non-seminoma, stage one, orchiectomy, and they either will get observation alone or retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. And that's gonna be based on what the testicle tumor shows. If it shows a predominant pattern of embryonal carcinoma or invasion of the vascular or lymphatic system in the testicle, those patients are generally best managed with RPLND immediately, despite the fact that their CT scans show no spread. Non-seminoma spread to the retroperitoneum. CT scan positive, small lymph nodes, less than two centimeters, 2A, they get RPLND in the United States. In Europe, chemotherapy. Predominantly, the answer would be RPLND. All others, high volume spread to the retroperitoneum or lung, mediastinum, or other sites, get chemo. You don't operate on people with eight centimeter retroperitoneal masses until they've gotten chemo. And again, EP or BEP are the two most common chemo regimens. After chemo, okay, very common situation. So a patient presents, gets chemo, now what do we do? After chemo for, uh, or radiation therapy for seminoma, any residual mass, so the mass starts at five centimeters, shrinks down to two centimeters, left in the retroperitoneum gets observed because the complication rates of surgery there are extremely high and the findings are generally fibrosis and, or benign findings. Anyone with any primary cancer who has an elevated systemic blood marker after chemo gets more chemo. This is a very simple concept, but it's one where they try to sneak in on you frequently. So patient gets non-seminoma, gets chemo. After the treatment, the CT looks good, but their beta HCG is 500, and the normal is less than two for a man. They do not get surgery. They have systemic disease. They get continuous chemo until their marker responds. After chemo for non-seminoma, which is different now than seminoma, residual masses get removed with what's called a post-chemotherapy RPLND. Fairly complex and high risk procedure, but that's the right thing to do because a high percentage of those will harbor residual active cancers, about 40%. So retroperitoneal lymph nodes that are still visible on CT after chemo for non-seminoma get taken out. Here's an example of a post-chemotherapy scan on a patient with extensive retroperitoneal lymph node metastases, and this was removed. So here's right kidney, left kidney, aorta, and the vena cava is displaced in here and you have extensive bilateral retroperitoneal lymph node metastases. His greatest dimension of this was 25 centimeters. This has to be taken out. It's a very big operation, but otherwise the people will die. This will, this will harbor persistent malignancy, in this case it did, and will regrow and, and respread. And even despite this presentation, these patients still associated with about a 60 to 70% chance of overall cure. So that's why, again, I think this is a common scenario. Complex, rare, and curable. Okay, uh, penile carcinoma, not a common cancer in the U.S., uh, very common in, in third world countries, Central America and West Africa. Uh, particularly, it's the number one cause of cancer in men in those areas. A presentation, generally a painless mass in an uncircumcised male. Diagnosis is either by circumcision if it's on the foreskin or biopsy, CAT scan and chest x-ray uh, to be staged. CAT scan must include the inguinal lymph nodes. So it's not an abdominal scan, it's a scan of the legs, the upper groin. Treatment is either with radical penectomy or partial penectomy, and if patients have palpable lymphadenopathy or high-risk features in the cancer, they get a lymph node dissection of the groin, uh, and that includes a transverse upper thigh incision and is complicated by lymphedema and flap necrosis of the skin overlying the femoral vessels, which can cause femoral artery or vein erosion into the skin and uh, extensive hemorrhage. Okay, urinary diversion, the bowel segments that can be used to reconstruct the urinary tract. And here's a classic interaction between a urolo urologist and a general surgeon, potentially. They're pretty much everything from the stomach on down to the sigmoid colon. Uh, but the most common would be the terminal ileum, <clears throat> terminal ileum in the form of an ileal conduit. Factors that have to be taken into consideration, prior radiation to the pelvis in patients with, with urologic malignancies, any coexistent bowel disease, including Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or uh, colon cancer, 
metabolic consequences of each segment of intestine, and then the fatal complications due to bowel anastomoses. There's about a 1% to 2% death rate after radical cystectomy and urinary diversion, and the vast majority of perioperative deaths are related to a complication from the reconstruction, not from the cystectomy. These are patients who generally will have an astomotic leak or obstruction resulting in reoperation in an 80-year-old man with prior chemo and radiation. So it's a morbid operation, and most of the morbidity revolves around the urinary diversion. So what happens if we use a segment of colon? Any segment of colon can be used from the cecum all the way to the sigmoid. Uh, very few metabolic consequences, one of which is loss of bicarb or acidosis, and that's relatively rare. We use the tinea of the colon for creation of what's called an anti-reflux mechanism. So the ureter can be tunneled through the muscle wall of the colon to prevent urine from flowing back up to the kidneys. A loss of bicarb and the ileocecal valve, if removed, can leave the patient with a new onset of diarrhea. So the ileum, the most common form of urinary diversion, is use of the terminal ileum, about 10 to 12 centimeters of which can be used to create an ileal conduit. This is a picture of an ileostomy created for an ileal conduit. And this is about 75% of people undergoing bladder cancer surgery, removal of their bladder, will have this form of urinary diversion in the US. It's good because it has an excellent blood supply. It's very mobile, redundant, very minimal B12 problems if you take 10 to 12 centimeters of the terminal ileum. And if you take an extensive amount, you can result in a hyperchloremic acidosis. It's common because it's simple. That's why an ileal conduit is done frequently. It is rapidly constructed, usually about an hour of extra time in the operating room. Uh, it has a very low complication rate, and its long-term complications include upper urinary tract infections, because it's an easy route of uh, bacterial entry into the urinary tract, and hydronephrosis. The reason why hydronephrosis is commonly seen after a long period of follow-up is that there is no anti-reflux mechanism. So urine is freely refluxing up into the kidneys from the conduit all the time. So that can result in some swelling of the kidneys. All right, those are in, that is an incontinent urinary diversion, which means wearing an appliance or a pouch 24 hours a day, seven days a week for life. What about a continent urinary diversion? And this is where you get into a little bit of a jumble of acronyms and eponyms, and everybody thinks of the, the common name, which is Indiana pouch. What does it mean when we say a, a new bladder is created with intestine and does not require wearing in a pouch of any kind or an appliance? Well, it breaks into two kinds. One is called a neobladder or orthotopic neobladder, and that means that some piece of intestine is used to form a pouch, and then that's connected to the urethra in a male or a female. And that can be small intestine, stomach rarely, or colon. These generally require us to use an anti-reflux mechanism and uh, they require some form of continence mechanism, in this case the external sphincter if it's connected back to the urethra. Complication rate higher, about three times the rate of an ileal conduit, and includes acidosis, stone formation in the new bladder, requiring surgical revision occasionally, and cancer recurrence in the remnant urethra. A cutaneous continent diversion means a small stoma brought out to the skin that does not leak, but requires a catheter to be passed every four hours. And that's where you hear the term Indiana pouch or Indiana diversion. It was first designed at the University of Indiana. It requires catheterization, and the ileocecal valve is oftentimes fashioned as the continence mechanism. So the patients are catheterizing through the terminal ileum into the pouch through the ileocecal valve, and that's why it doesn't leak. Okay, urologic emergencies, shift gears. Trauma, acute retention, testicular torsion, priapism, ureteral obstruction, and Fournier's gangrene. We'll touch on those. Ureteral obstruction and kidney stones I'm not going to go heavily into. Uh, it's common, but it's relatively straightforward in the sense that the obstruction gets relieved and the stone gets extracted. Okay, renal trauma. The vast majority of uh, renal uh, trauma in a non-combat situation are going to be blunt trauma, uh, commonly associated with other abdominal injuries, presentations with gross or microscopic hematuria. You look for associated fractures that are commonly associated with kidney injuries, such as rib fractures or transverse process fractures of the spine. Uh, classic scenario there is a rapid deceleration injury with no other injuries other than acute arterial disruption or disruption of the ureter from the renal pelvis, resulting in uh, extravasation of urine. Uh, the classification systems, I'm sure you have to memorize for, for the boards for trauma in general, but just to review, hematuria, microscopic or gross, with just a bruise or contusion, that's a class one injury. Class two, small cortical laceration, no extravasation. Uh, larger laceration without urinary extravasation is class three. 
Four would be laceration with extravasation or thrombosis of the main renal artery. And then five would be what we refer to as a traumatic nephrectomy or shattered kidney, essentially complete avulsion of the vessels or uh, complete shattering of the multiple complex comminuted fractures of the renal parenchyma. So the history and the physical are usually going to point you to the kidney if, if uh, that's a high likelihood to be injured. And 90% of these injuries are associated with either gross or, or microscopic hematuria. However, the degree of hematuria is not always correlated with the severity of the injury. And here's a common question. Blunt trauma, not penetrating trauma, blunt trauma to the flank or abdomen and microhematuria in an adult. The patient comes in, was hit with a baseball bat in the abdomen, and they have five red blood cells on their UA. And they immediately call down and say, send them up to the CAT scanner to rule out shattered kidney. Uh, the reality is that that is almost never associated with significant injury to the kidney. And in an adult, microscopic hematuria and blunt trauma warrants no further, injury, or no further imaging of the renal uh, and collecting system unless there's another abdominal injury. So it's gross hematuria, hypotension, penetrating trauma, uh, or any trauma with microhematuria in a child. That's different. So blunt trauma to a child with microhematuria does warrant a, C a CT scan because their threshold for um, hypotension is much greater. Okay, so indications for intervention. Here you have a patient who, uh, in this case, let's say had a stab wound uh, to the flank, and you have uh, loss of uh, viability of this area of the kidney. There's loss of actual uh, preservation of the blood supply, so you get loss of enhancement on a CT scan. Uh, there is air in the soft tissue around the kidney, and there is urinary extravasation right here uh, on a contrast-enhanced CT scan. So absolute indications for intervention in uh, renal trauma would include, uh, obviously, hemorrhage with instability. So a patient with isolated renal injury, dropping blood count, requiring transfusion. Uh, at exploration, this is a patient who's in the operating room, open for another reason, an expanding or unstable hematoma in the flank at exploration. That mandates exploration and control, and that's with a proximal control of the renal vessels at the root of the small bowel mesentery. You can cut down onto the aorta, control the renal artery, and then explore the hematoma. Do not obviously explore the hematoma without control proximally as, as the kidney uh, releasing and expanding hematoma in the flank can result in sudden destabilization. Uh, an arterial injury in a solitary kidney changes your indication. So you have a patient with one known one kidney who has a mild injury. You obviously have to up your threshold for intervention as they become anephric if that kidney is lost. Now, what about relative indications? These are ones where they'll try to entice you to go to the operating room, and the answer is generally no. They do not require intervention. Non-viable tissue. So on this scan, you see an area that is not perfused by blood. So should you go in and clean that out and debride it? No. The vast majority of the time, if that is ischemic, it will, it will become atrophic and the kidney will still function. Urinary extravasation, in and of itself, that does not require intervention. It sounds like an ominous problem. Urine is leaking inside you, but in fact, that can be managed with either just observation or ureteral stenting. It does not require open surgery. Renal artery thrombosis, in general, that is uncorrectable. That's not a problem that can be fixed surgically unless it's detected and fixed immediately after it occurs, which is rarely the case. And then a laparotomy for associated injury. So there's one where your indications may change slightly. You're there, and you know that the patient on pre-op imaging has a ureteral extravasation, so you're going to maybe explore the ureter and see if a stent is all that's needed. But that's not in and of itself a reason to operate. Okay, so treatment, staging, blunt trauma, virtually all can be managed expectantly. Penetrating injuries, as you know, will almost always be explored, uh, at least gunshot wounds and abdominal stab wounds. Flank stab wound with no other associated injury on CT and a minimal injury to the kidney can be managed expectantly. And then, of course, remember the one-shot intra-op IVP. So the classic uh, urology board question is they walk you through to the operating room on a, on a trauma case and you didn't get a complete history and you get there for a relatively marginal indication to explore the right kidney and you don't realize that the patient actually had a left nephrectomy for a gunshot wound 20 years prior and you open up an expanding hematoma and end up doing a right nephrectomy. Well, any time during the process, if a CT scan is not obtained, an intraoperative IVP giving intravenous contrast, roughly um, one cc per one milligram per kilo, as a bolus injection and one flat plate x-ray will at least tell you that there are, in fact, two kidneys in this patient before you go exploring a hematoma on one side. Uh, they will not give you much architectural anatomical detail, so don't allow them to say the one-shot IVP 
doesn't show extravasation or doesn't show a tumor. They don't tell you any details about the kidney. They just tell you it's there. So the vascular injury is, is usually arterial, vein rarely, and both very rarely. Renal vessel thrombosis, as I said before, is rarely correctable unless it's fixed immediately. Uh, and the golden hour is usually about six to eight hours, a golden window of opportunity. We talked about...